Okay, I'm just going to trust that's working. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, hello everyone. Welcome to another Metaphysics or Physics interview. Today we are interviewing the uh, physicist and... Oh, hold on. I can... Hold on, I, need, I can hear myself on that other thing. It's going to close that. It's, anno it's really annoying. Okay. Why? <clears throat> there, okay. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so... It's, we are in interviewing the physicist James Elias, and he's going to tell us about his um, inductive physics project. Okay, Thanks for having me on, Green. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, uh, let's get started with the obvious question. Tell us about your uh, your inductive summary of physics project. So, um, so we'll. Uh, so right now I'm making a series of videos. Well, actually, so over, overall, the, my, my project, my YouTube channel is called um, the Inductive Physics Project. And basically what it's seeking to do is, is first is to systematize physics um, in terms of its actual inductive proof. Um, in terms of its actual inductive proof. So... Um, so uh, what that means is, is that um, the proof will be conducted at the, the, the various principles of physics. I will, con I will prove them actually in terms of the evidence and reasoning steps that allow us to know them in the first place. And the reason that this is so important, and we'll, we'll get into the details of this, I'm sure, with, with more questions. The, reasons, the reason why this is important is, is that the only way to really understand a principle is to understand the evidence for it. It's not just that you need the evidence to know that the principle is true. That's true, that's the case. But almost more importantly than that, you need the evidence in order to properly apply the principle. Um, and as we go, as we kind of get more into the, some of these questions we're gonna talk about, you'll see why. Um, and so the purpose of this is to give us a clear understanding of physics, which I don't think we have in the modern day. We've taken many, many modern physicists have taken many, many steps down many different incorrect paths. They're making a lot of incorrect assumptions. It's kind of like back in early in the early Renaissance where people thought that the earth was at the center. They had this bad assumption, which caused them to approach the entire subject incorrectly. We're in a much worse state of confusion now in physics than we even were back then. Um, we're under the spell of many more confusions now. And so to my, in my uh, approach, the only, way to, uh, the only way to get back on track is to reprove everything from the ground up. And so we'll, we'll talk more about what that entails. But that's the essence of the project. And I think once I systematize physics in terms of inductive proof, there will be a chance at discovering new physical principles and actually making progress. So that's the, that's the basic, uh, uh, that's my basic uh, idea of my project. Okay. Uh, tell us more about the role of induction in physics. So, um, so basically uh, the role in, of induction in physics is kind of the same as the role of induction in any other subject. As I said, you need to know why a principle is true in order to even apply that principle correctly. So here's, here's an example. Um, in early physics, um, everyone laughed at the idea that the sun was at the center of the solar system because this would mean that the earth would have to move. And everyone thought that this is crazy because, well, movement requires force which means that we would always feel as though the earth were getting pushed all the time. We would feel pushed by the earth. If the earth was moving, it would require that we always be hanging on for dear life as, you know, as the earth careens around the sun at these incredible speeds that 
Galileo and Copernicus are are suggesting. Um, and the reason, but this is based on a faulty assumption. It's based on the assumption that you need force to cause motion. And in most cases, it's true. In most cases, you do need force to cause motion. You know, in order to push an object across a table, you have to keep pushing it or else it'll slow down. So, so well, what's the problem? It was like, well, if that assumption was based on observation, then what was wrong with it? What was wrong is, is that they didn't actually check the assumption. How do you know the cause of why things slow down? And because they didn't have an answer to that, they applied the principle in a case where it didn't apply. You don't need continued force to keep the earth moving through the vacuum of space, although they didn't necessarily know it was a vacuum. But in general, you don't need force to cause continued motion. You need force only to cause a change in motion. So if there are no opposing forces like friction, the, the earth will just keep going at the speed it's going. And so because people didn't ask, how do we know that's true? They applied their principle, which was kind of a true principle. Generally, you do need to push on stuff in order to keep it moving. Because they didn't ask, why is that principle true? They applied the principle to a case where it didn't actually make sense. And this is universal in modern physics. Physicists don't know the proof of the concepts and generalizations they use. They're, repeat, they're assuming that previous physicists got it right which on some level might be, in some cases, it might be justified. Like, you know, after all, buildings aren't collapsing and stuff like that. But if you don't know the actual proof, you don't know when to apply it. And so I think, um, so in that, that's why modern physics desperately needs induction, it desperately needs an inductive proof of these, this enormous edifice of prior knowledge that we just kind of take for granted. And until we stop taking it for granted and actually proving it, we won't see new fundamental progress in physics. Right. Okay. Um, many of our listeners may be aware of the book, The Logical Leap, where David Harriman and Leonard Peikoff present a theory of induction. Um, is there anything you would add or amend from the to, uh, and is there any way you would add to or amend the theory of induction presented in that book? Um, so, yeah, um, I think, oh, I've lost my own picture here. Now I'm back. Okay, so, um, um, so first I'd say before I talk about anything I would amend or add, I'll say that the logical leap is absolutely revolutionary. It, it's in it. I mean, I couldn't have done any of my work without the logical leap. I'd have to do everything David Harriman did first if I were to do what I'm doing now. So oh, yeah. <laughs> any, yeah, yeah. Well, so, I mean, well, this, I mean, so I, even though I will make certain criticisms in a couple minutes, like I want to make that really clear. Anything I do, including the amendments should be considered essentially building off of uh, Leonard Peikoff and David Harriman, not some sort of rejection of it, even though I will, I'm about to sort of emphasize certain things I do disagree with. So, you know, I'm, I'm putting that up front to, to yep. um, make that clear. Um, I think, I think the biggest thing that that book uh, does is, is it shows us that knowledge has to come in a certain inductive order, that the only way to understand, you know, the only way to reason from observations is to go in a particular order. And Harriman, by giving tons of examples of that in the book and also um, in his lecture series that he has on the Van Dam Academy, it shows you step by step what it means to reason inductively, what it means to build your knowledge on top of your prior knowledge and what it means to actually integrate new observations with prior knowledge and how you, and he gives the general idea of how you go from one step to another. I don't think he makes a lot of it explicit, but he shows you how it can be done. And for that, um, it's, it's, it's revolutionary. It, and it's so revolutionary that I think a lot of people who read it and even objectivists who read it and really engaged with it seriously, didn't understand its main point. Um, and like one one way to see this is, is a lot of the criticisms you'll see will um, will Ugh. that well yeah, the thing is I think they're serious criticisms but they're but they're seriously um, um, 
Well, I don't know. They're, they're serious criticisms, but I, I disagree with them. So, I mean, there for a lot, example, of, a lot, got of, a lot times, of criticism. Yeah. What's that? That book got a lot of criticism. Yeah. For a lot it, of, a lot of different reasons. A lot of people clearly didn't understand the book. Yeah. Like, uh, what's his name? McKeskey and those sorts of people. Well, McK people. Um, my jury is actually out on McCaskey because we have yet to see what his view of induction is. Uh, from what I understand, he's writing his own book. So, I'm going to wait, actually. And I've seen McCaskey write certain things that actually really helped my thinking. Um, so we'll see. Um, okay. So, but I although made... a lot of his criticisms, actually, we'll talk about the McCaskey criticisms. Or I'll talk about them right now since we brought them up. I think, so yeah. McCaskey criticizes the, um, this is one of the minor criticisms. But they're not one of the more important ones, but it's worth noting. McCaskey criticizes the, uh, the logical leap um, because a lot of times it's historical accounts don't, um, aren't accurate basically. And as far as I can tell, McCaskey's right about this. Um, well, I mean, um, McCaskey gives really good arguments for the fact that David Harriman, a lot of times almost changes the history. Um, there, for example, uh, McCaskey gives this one example where of, uh, uh Harriman's treatment of, Galileo's um, induction of um, the law of free fall. And when Galileo was thinking about the law of free fall, Galileo was getting two things, two concepts packaged deal dealt together, namely air resistance and buoyancy. He was getting them packaged dealt together. Um, and I'm not sure why Galileo was confused about that, but he, he, Galileo really was confused about that. And, but what Harriman does in his treatment, he, Harriman just brushes past that entire confusion Galileo had in order to make the story simpler. Yeah. Do you think maybe he was, he, he, um, Harriman was trying to, he was trying to simplify some very yeah. complex stuff. Do you think maybe he oversimplified it? Think some things a little bit, maybe. I don't do you think, think it's oversimplified. Or do you think it or do you think it's some of do you think it's some locations are justified, but you just have to sort of read between the lines a bit? Yeah. The 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 simplifications are justified, but Harriman doesn't justify them. He just makes them and then like I guess hopes you won't think they're a big deal. Now, I didn't think they were a big deal, but McCaskey as I and I and and from what I can tell, McCaskey's a very serious student of the history of physics. In fact, he's almost like too, from what I can tell, it's almost like he's too focused on the actual history. What in, uh, um, so, and Harriman really did seem to amend the history. So what's the, well, so what's the deal here? My solution to this is, is that Harriman faces like a huge obstacle, which is that the history of physics is full of, um, wrong turns and not to mention just minor wrinkles like this thing with Galileo where he's getting buoyancy mm. and, and air resistance, like buoyancy of the, how much the ball floats in air versus how the ball is ramming into air on its way down. And, and Galileo didn't have the, um, the, the, I mean, Galileo could have gotten straight on this actually based on things that were available to, at, to him at the time, but it turns out he just didn't. Harriman just basically decided, hey, I'm going to simplify this by just pretending Galileo wasn't confused about this. And I think that is fine because based on his context of knowledge at the time, Galileo didn't have to be confused on that. In fact, you in fact, in my treatment. So and so this leads me to like my my base, a difference between me and the logical leap and, and almost like Dar David Harriman's approach um, is that. I don't really focus on the history. I treat the history as a kind of suggestion. What really matters, what's essential, is the order that all of this stuff could have been discovered. Um, and so as a result, as long as you're clear that this is a fictional streamlined account, you can make these simplifications. So I think Harriman was thinking that way implicitly because he recognized that this little wrinkle of Galileo's wasn't essential. But mm. on what standard was it not essential? He doesn't explain that. The standard on, and so I will, the standard on which it's not, these little, little wrinkles are not essential, is that we're interested in understanding how to generalize from observation. 
To do that, we don't need to actually explain every detail of the actual history. We can streamline it. And, and as long as it's a path that is logical, a path that it could have been discovered in, we don't need to worry about these details um, unless we're interested, unless we're interested in something else, unless we're somehow interested in the history for some other reason, maybe just for sheer historical study. But I'm only interested in the history insofar as it helps us with induction. So that's something I'm kind of adding on to, I'm mean, sort of explicating, I would say, about Harriman's approach. So um, I guess he, I guess he could have saved himself a lot of trouble if he had pointed that out in the beginning that I'm presenting a slightly, slightly streamlined version of history which might not be entirely accurate for illustrative purposes. Yeah. But to didn't. be fair, yeah. Yeah, right. To be fair to McCaskey, though, um, McCaskey hints somewhere in his writings that his focus on these historical differences is actually important to his, to, to, like, it, it actually has, it actually uh, manifests differences in his theory of induction. So we'll see what happens with with that, with McCaskey. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's... Um, but other things with the logical leap. Um, so um, let's see. I got it. Let's let's see. I'll I'll remind myself here about the logical leap. Um, so a criticism that another criticism that the logical leap got, and I think this was a justified one. It was like fifty percent justified. Is that it doesn't actually solve the problem of induction, and I think this is true. I think the logical leap doesn't actually give you the um, basic process by which we make generalizations. I don't think it does that. I think it solves the hard part, which is that you have to think in an inductive order. You can only, whenever you attack a certain issue in physics, you have to be clear on what context of knowledge you're using if you're going to want to, if you're going to understand how induction works. What a lot of modern philosophers of science will do is they'll take every, they'll treat every piece of knowledge in physics as just equal in the hierarchy. They'll just say, oh, well, this is true and this is true and this is true. Oh, but Newton didn't understand Einstein. So I guess Newton was just wrong. They don't understand. I mean, like, yeah, they'll, they'll make really noob errors like this. Um, they'll make, you know, just, they're very silly errors once you realize that knowledge has to come in this particular order. And so, and there's a lot of, and there's ways to get that wrong that are not nearly as obvious as I just stated them. And Harriman solves that by, by demonstrating how it works over and over again. The serious student of the logical leap can understand the basic way, how the basic way our context of knowledge grows with observation. And, and reasoning steps and further observation and further reasoning steps. So, um, you know, I, the way I put it, would put it is this, it's true that it doesn't solve the problem of induction when it claims to, but the book is so powerful that I, uh, can't help but be a little, uh, mad at the detractors, um, because I think they really de-emphasized what, um, what the book gets right. Um, the way David or the way Harry Benzwanger puts it is that it breaks the back of the, of the problem of induction. And that's true. It solves the hard part. There's still additional work to do. So it doesn't, I don't think it gives you the basic way that we generalize from observation, but it, it solves the hard part. It solves the main obstacle that was in people's way. And, um, and so, and so, um, yeah, so that I can't, I can't say enough good things about the book. Um, but, uh, here's, here's the main thing I would add to it. And it has, and, and I think this does at least solve a part of the solution to the problem of induction. It shows you what, what I have in mind in my working theory of induction that I'm, that I'm working on and will apply is that I, I think I've identified one way that we can, make generalizations by integrating our knowledge. Um, and uh, Peikoff doesn't really do that. So for example, he talks about first level generalizations. He talks about how, um, 
how say like a, a kid, he looks at a ball and he sees that it rolls. And so he comes to a generalization balls roll. Well, now a lot of valid criticism has arised in the fact like, well, how does he know that balls generally roll? And then further, they'll say that the book has a similar problem later. And this is a valid criticism. They'll say, um, you know, uh, later in the book, Harriman talks about how Kepler concluded planets obey my three laws. Kepler comes up with three laws of planetary motion. And, and Harriman says, you know, Kepler um, immediately generalized and said, like, all planets follow this pattern. And the criticisms are, well, again, on what basis did he generalize? And Harriman doesn't have an answer to this. Um, he, he, Peacock talks about how the, the general nature, the general and open-ended nature of concepts allows, it means like what's true of some members of the class will be true of all, but he doesn't show how exactly what, by what process you make the connection. You, you actually say, well, what was it, for example, in the case of Kepler's third laws, how do you know this would apply to all planets? And I mean, for that particular example, I don't think Kepler did know it. I don't think Kepler did know it would apply to all planets. He didn't know what it was about planets that caused them to follow his law. Newton then figured it out. But we have to, if we're going to see if we're going to have a um, rigorous account of how we generalize, we're going to need more details than what Harriman gives. And that's going to come out in this uh, paper. Um, that I'm working on right now. So I don't want to, I don't want to give that away too early, but that's, that's a basic idea of where I came from intellectually and where I'm going. Um, it's, it's really centered around the logical leap and building off of it. Okay. Um, okay. Anything else to say about induction before we move on from that topic, more or less? Um, yeah, more, more to say about induction. Um, um, no, I think, I think, uh, that's generally what I'd say about induction. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, tell us about your video. I believe it's called, there are two hierarchies of knowledge. Okay. So, um, this, this is actually the, the that video. And then also a video I make about implicit premises is, um, is actually, um, sort of the build up to my working theory of induction. Um, basically, I think there's a number of, there's a couple of misconceptions that objectivists are generally under that's preventing us from understanding a solution to the problem of induction. And in these two videos, I clear away those two errors. First of all, I should say, only objectivists are going to understand the, the solution to the problem of induction, as far as I'm concerned. You, you need objectivism. Um, there may be some kind of Aristotelian context of knowledge that certain Aristotle scholars might have. Maybe I haven't met them, but basically, as far as I'm concerned, all of my work just built off of objectivism, except in certain places where I might disagree with, you know, certain aspects of the epistemology. Um, and I'll talk about more on that in a minute. So, First, the first video I do is on implicit premises, and this is actually about introspection, but I think there's an error we make that objectivists tend to make when we think about implicit premises that is critical to uh, clearing the road, clearing the red lights, as Peacock would say, before we uh, solve the prop. We, we at least understand one, this, this one part of the solution to the problem of induction I'm going to propose. So, um, and in that video, I, I go through it in detail, but um, I'll summarize it here. Um, basically, it consists of a package deal between the implicit and the subconscious. Um, a lot of objectivists, not, not Ayn Rand or Leonard Peikoff, by the way, but a lot of objectivists um, make the mistake, including myself at one point, this is why it was so important to me. They make the mistake of thinking that if you think or act in a way which implies a certain premise, then it means that you necessarily somehow hold that implication subconsciously. 
So for example, um, if let's say there's a woman who's a Christian, um, but when she shows up to work, she always acts towards profit. She's always, she's, you know, she's a ruthless businesswoman. She's always, um, she's always, um, you know, uh, out there for profit. She's always um, making uh, decisions that maximize her own welfare. So an objectivist might look at her and say like, well, it doesn't seem like she's really a Christian. It seems like she's more of an egoist because they're rightly recognizing that she's her, her behavior and maybe even some of the narrow premises she holds while she's at work are consistent with objectivism. But just because those narrow premises imply um, egoism doesn't mean there's some part of her that's actually an egoist. It's just that. And because we kind of get implicit and subconscious package deal, we think, oh, she must somehow subconsciously be an egoist. And so like, and, and this ends up screwing you up when you try to introspect, this can be not all objectivists make this error, but I was making it really badly. Um, and it makes introspection torture basically, or at least it can for a lot of people it does. And I think this is actually the cause of a lot of people abandoning objectivism because they just, it, it leads to certain errors and it just gets, uh, too gnarly. And I think, uh, I think a lot of the people Leonard Peikoff was talking about at the beginning of understanding objectivism, remember how he goes through like the three arguments against philosophy, like philosophy is basically useless and like, Oh, you're always in conflict with other people. You're always in conflict with yourself. I, I suspect that those aren't serious arguments. I suspect that these are basically like the statements of people who've given up um, and given up kind of for good reason because introspection and trying to adhere to this philosophy has just caused them nothing but pain. So that's, I think a lot of it was that, although Peacock thinks it's rationalism, but, and that, that's, that's something I'd have to think about more, but so, so I take this one premise and it ends up connecting to some other stuff. Um, so there's that then in the two hierarchies of knowledge video, um, I point out a certain um, paradox that I think a lot of serious students of objectivism have noticed, which is that the hierarchy of knowledge um, that Peikoff talks about a lot in OPAR and in a lot of his lectures, the hierarchy of knowledge is supposed to be an order of learning. And, but the OPAR order clearly isn't an order of learning because obviously a little kid doesn't start out with, you know, the axioms and all of that stuff, all of the, uh, all of the like stuff that's first in OPAR. And a lot of people have noticed this. Okay. It's, 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 it appears to be some sort of paradox. And um, yeah, so a lot of objectivists have noticed this, like serious students of objectivism. Um, and they end up asking Peikoff himself and Peikoff's answer is, is that, this, the, the stuff that's early in the OPAR order is held implicitly. And that's basically his solution is that, okay, you're building off of that early stuff, but you don't know it explicitly, you know it implicitly. Because when the baby opens his eyes, he sees that, that he think he sees a bunch of things. If, if, you know, if, if this yo-yo is what it is, then everything has to be what it is. So he, like, he knows something which implies the law of identity. But as I sort of make the point in the first video, you can't reason from an implicit premise because you don't actually hold the premise. It's just, in, it's not in your subconscious. It's just implied by what you've loaded into your brain or your subconscious. So as a, so as a result, it's not clear, basically the account Leonard Peikoff gives uh, and, and as far as I can tell, this is actually an error in objectivism because Peikoff gives it in certain lectures where Ayn Rand is present and watching the lecture. And I assume she like signed off on it. Um, and he doesn't, and she doesn't, and he doesn't correct himself in late, uh, Peikoff doesn't correct himself in later lectures. Um, so I suspect, so what I think we need to do is make a differentiation between the hierarchy of induction, which is the order of learning, which things do you have to know in order to discover which other things? And that's the hierarchy that Peikoff and Harriman really emphasize in the logical leap. And then there's another hierarchy, which I refer to as the causal hierarchy, which is something like an OPAR hierarchy. 
which it tells you, okay, A is A and the other axioms, they apply to everything else. They condition the, all of the facts that they apply to. But that doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean it comes first in an order of learning. It comes first implicitly because because it because the top of the of the top of OPAR sort of applies to all our other knowledge, you can say that everything implies it. But really, it's much later in an order of learning. But the sense in which it's first is that it applies to everything. Um, so that, so we need to make a distinction between a hierarchy, a causal hierarchy, like which things apply to other, which facts apply to other facts and which ideas do you need to know first in order to, um, in order to learn other ideas. And these are related, but it, but two issues that need to be differentiated, even though they are in fact related. Um, and I could say a lot more on that, but I've, <laughs> I, I could dump my whole lecture out again, but watch the two lectures. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, tell us about the uh, brief history of physics series on your YouTube channel. So um, the, the history of physics series. Um, um, yeah. I'm just, I'm just giving a brief history of physics there. Um, that's a series. That's where I just give a simple, I mean, although I should, I should say, I don't, I actually don't make this clear in the lectures. That's a simplified history of physics. Um, although because I'm saying it's brief and it's clear, I'm being, um, you know, it's just a summary. I don't think McCaskey type criticisms will be validly leveled against it, but that's just supposed to be, um, you know, the, you know, just getting clear on the history what I consider sort of more important is the inductive summary of physics. And that's where I'm giving my current understanding of an inductive order. It's not rigorous yet because um, it takes a lot of work to make it rigorous, number one, and I'm still working on that. And then number two, um, my working theory of induction is not fully worked out. So once I do work it out, I'll be able to really go step by step and really prove each step. But I'm just sort of laying the found in the inductive summary of physics, which is which will end up being a 20 lecture series. Um, I have six lectures out currently, I think. Um, that's going to give you the whole story. Well, it's going to give you the schematic of the whole story, all the way from the Greek astronomers, all the way to the modern day, as far as my mind can go, basically, which means quantum and relativity, but only as far as I understand it. And I think if, if, if you're honest with yourself about what you understand and what you don't understand, you can't get much further than about 1920 in the, uh, in the order. Um, that's been my experience, though maybe I'm Harriman in some of his work goes further than 1920, but um, he probably knows things I don't. He's been doing it a lot longer. So, yeah. So that's, that's, those, that's sort of what I'm doing with those two series. It's sort of a precursor to setting up, um, setting up the project to come. Uh, I think in Kango, a little bit further, he talks about uh, the implications of Bell, the work of that Bell guy and how that, is relevant to quantum mechanics and stuff, but who who got further? Uh, Bell. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. With with the exception of Bell, well, um, I think maybe. anything past the 1960s mm. is very unclear. Although maybe we'll we'll talk about Bell here in just a minute. I think. <laughs> yeah. 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 Not much past the 1920s, with maybe a few exceptions like with a few that. things yeah right definitely yeah. bell and a few and a few other things that maybe i i simply haven't seen yet um and yeah. maybe someone could figure out what this gravitational wave stuff it is about I, I don't, although, gravitational wave huh oh the gravitational i haven't heard of that the gravitate the so-called gravitational waves maybe someone could oh. figure out yeah oh i see yeah yeah gravitational wave. maybe someone could do something something with that something the, the I thing think, is I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll opine quickly on that. I think gravitational waves are an application. Gravitational waves are a deduction. And it, I mean, that's not me saying it's bad. Deduction is not a dirty word. It's not the opposite <laughs> of induction. For some people who use it that way, don't they don't know what they're talking about. Like literally, they don't know what they're saying. Deduction's fine. 
But what I'm trying to say by it's a deduction is as far as I can tell, gravitational waves, they come from <clears throat> principles which were all, it's a deduction from principles which were already known, like in the 20s, I think. It was as early as the 20s. Um, and we detected them. Good. Like that's, that is progress, but it's not fundamental progress. Well, that's what, that's what I was going to say. I, I was going to say it's more, it's more what they imply about what we already know, or claim to know, or <clears throat> don't know. <laughs> I yeah. don't think it's, I don't think it's a fun, big fundamental shift. Like some people have said it is. No, yeah. I, it's not, it's not fundamental. Whereas Bell's work was fundamental. That's, that's why it's a notable exception. Like in the sixties, yeah. Something new yeah. was discovered. Something really fundamentally new was discovered. At, well, mm. was was hypothesized and then confirmed with the experiment. I think in the eighties or nineties, they confirmed Bell's findings, his theoretical findings, experimentally, and that's fundamental progress. Um, but I'll I'll have a lot to say about that in my summary of yeah. physics series about and what if, happened yeah. when that fundamental progress was not was made or not made depending on how you look at it yeah i suspect everyone's interpreting those results um <clears throat> somewhat incorrectly <laughs> yeah right <laughs> it's i mean it's only fundamental progress if you look at it a certain way the way most physicists look at it it's it's i mean the way most physicists look at things today there is no such thing as progress at all because they they don't really think about the physical world so like anything they come up with i i i would struggle to think about any way they could really make progress because i i fundamentally don't think they really think about physics anymore um when they talk i don't know what they're saying and i have a master's in physics i've been thinking about this for 10 years i don't know what they what they're saying like zeilinger when he when he talks like people some even some objectivists like i don't know i'm kind of ranting let's let's get back <laughs> let's get back on track I, yeah well <laughs> that's what i say i don't think uh, gravitational waves is going to go anywhere very interesting because no one really knows what to make of it in a very useful way not on its own i think not on its own mm -hmm. um in in if integrated with other things that we know i think maybe then i don't know if people are going to make those integrations. I think they're going to try and integrate it with other, with um, the wrong ideas. So yeah, yeah. Well, it's an integration, an integration of gravitational waves with, say, the ideas of quantum mechanics would require an understanding of what quantum mechanics is referring to, which we don't have. <laughs> And it would it would it would need an understanding of what relativity refers to, which we also don't understand. Ultimately. Yeah. And and, no and those questions are not even being asked. They're yeah. such questions are considered unscientific. So so long as well, any scientist who approaches it in that manner will not make new integrations. Right. Um, but the plan is is that if you got clear on all of this stuff and you did approach it in such a manner, you'd have a shot. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, oh, this would be a good time for this question. Tell us about the role of mathematics in physics. Ooh, this, I, I'm glad you asked this question uh, <laughs> because, so I think mathematics is very important in physics. Um, uh, you had on your show earlier, Bill Gade, who I feel like he disparaged mathematics uh, too much. Mm. Yeah. He, um, his, it's almost like, yeah, I mean, so he he um, I think he really let modern physicists give mathematics a bad name because everything he says about them, I don't know about everything, but like a lot of what he says about them is 100 percent true. They're thinking about the math. They're trying to de modern physicists are trying to derive mathematical schemes to basically um, identify patterns in the observation. They're fundamentally unconcerned with whether their schemes and hypotheses actually refer to some physical cause and effect relationship. Um, you know, like they're, they're not really concerned if space is literally a thing that bends. Um, if you, if you ask, how do you know that space is literally a thing that bends? They just kind of won't answer the question. Like, how do you, like, how do you know? They just like, ah, that's not really my department. Like that's kind of a philosophy question. Um, so anyway, like he's right that there's an overemphasis in mathematics, but mathematics itself is insanely important in physics. Um, and here's a couple, re here's a couple ways. It's, um, 
mathematics, first of all, is necessary for identifying cause and uh, identifying cause and effect relationships in certain contexts. If you see, for example, that um, you know, as you increase the mass of a body, a given force um, will accelerate the body less. You see that the mass retards the acceleration and you see that there's an inverse proportional relationship. The math has now told you that there's a cause and effect relationship between those. And actually, so to sort of correct something I said earlier, the logical leap does thoroughly explain that way of establishing a generalization. If, if um, so that's so that's one way is through it's what uh, John Stuart Mill called a concomitant variation. It means as you vary the amount of one thing, the amount of the other thing varies with it in a controlled set of observations, such as an experiment. Um, when that happens, you know that there's something about mass that retards acceleration. It doesn't necessarily tell you what it is about mass that retards the acceleration but it shows you that there is a cause and effect relationship. You can't grasp these things without math. Um, in addition, math tells us the kind of cause and effect relationship a lot of times. Like, so for example, with the inverse square law, um, gravity obeys an inverse square law. It means that the further away from the planet you get or from the source of gravitation you get, the weaker the force is, and, it's, and it just so happens when Newton discovered it, that it got weaker as the square of the distance. So if you double the distance, it's, it's one fourth of the force. If you triple the distance, it's one ninth the force. When you, you would think if you tripled the distance, it would be one third the force, but it's one ninth. It's the square of the distance. Then later, I'm not sure who, but someone realized that an inverse square law is totally consistent with the hypothesis that the sun or the gravitational object is shooting some sort of stuff in every direction. And the reason is, is because the area of a sphere depends on its radius squared. So if that stuff is diluting itself over the, like the square of a radius, then um, you get the inverse square law. So I think this basically, I mean, unless unless some other explanation could be found, but the only explanation that is possible in our context of knowledge is that gravitation works through some sort of spherically spreading effect. And so you couldn't and you couldn't you couldn't identify this without math. So uh, math tells you the 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 nature of the cause and effect relationship also. Um, so, don't don't let modern physicists let math give give math a bad name. Math is fantastic. It's just the way it's taught and thought about that's boring as hell and it looks useless, but it isn't. <laughs> yeah, that's that's Bugatti's error, right? He sees mathematics is <clears throat> abused and he assumes well, there's no other use for it. Without no, therefore, mathematics is obviously useless. Yeah. Even though if he looked at the history of physics, well, that's obviously not the case. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think I, I like Gady in that he is focused on the physical world, um, but that's not enough on its own. And I think, I think um, you know, the oversimplicity of his view sort of shows in that. It's not enough to just be focused on the physical world. Um, I, I almost want to say, I don't want to give, I don't want to disparage him wrongly, but I would say he's like a mechanicalist. He thinks that fundamentally you have to explain everything in terms of, you know, lit like literal objects bumping into one another. Like that's the only anything other than anything other than that. And he thinks it's not real. Like it's almost like he would be against fields. You, you see what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. it's like everything is one for him. Like if you're not explaining in terms of one body bumping into another body as opposed to, you know, um, a charge, a charged particle shooting out some kind of emanation with it, which attracts the negatively charged particle and thinking of it in terms of the properties of some underlying ether, maybe. And that's not necessarily a mechanical process. It's not necessarily one body bumping into another body. Maybe it is, but there isn't really evidence of such bodies. Um, but he, it seems like he's under that impression, but I haven't, looked at him enough to know that that's really, he talks about ropes pulling on each other, 
in order to when he thinks of fields, right? Um, right. So mm -hmm. it seems like he he wants to have a mechanical view of the universe, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, that seems like it's just an assumption based on prior experience. Um, it's it seems like, um, and not based on knowing it has to be that way for some reason by the identity of the things. Well, uh, uh, Andy seems to be against experimentation, anyways. I don't, don't Wait, know really. Gonna, <laughs> I don't really know how he's going to verify that. Oh, I, I believe he said. Um, I, I can't remember. What, I can't remember what he said, but he said the impression I got was you make an hypothesis, and well, you don't need to go and test it. It's, it's true. Or it makes sense, or it doesn't. Hmm. I, maybe I'm misrepresenting him. Uh, it, 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 I mean, he could. It's possible he's just kind of unclear on this stuff. Um, but I, I think this is where my knowledge of his view um, is not enough to say more. So I don't want to. I've probably already been a little unfair to him. <laughs> maybe, maybe I mis, maybe I misinterpreted what he said. But mm -hmm. uh, if I can remember what he but, said. Mm -hmm. But that's the impression he gave me that that we make an hypothesis doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's it. I mean, that's definitely one. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm oversimplifying. Maybe he has maybe. more to the view, but he simply expressed himself unclearly there. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> I just thought that that was interesting. Okay. Um, so we have mathematics. Okay. Uh, who are some of your favorite people in physics, dead or alive? So, <laughs> alive, David Harriman. Yeah. David Harriman. Um, yeah. I mean, like, I think, yeah, as far as I know, there are, as far as, I mean, I don't want to discount other people, but no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say what I just said. When I get, when I'm live on an interview, I kind of shoot my mouth off and say things that I, I'm not fully certain of, so mm. I'm trying to rein myself in a little bit. I'm I always is do I always have kind of a script when I make my videos, and I'm always really careful because when when I just kind of let my subconscious do it, I I just I, I'm a little too hasty. But dead physicists, um, I mean, there's too many to name, but I'll just I'll just give you two, um, and I'll give you sort of. Um, lesser known aspects. So first Newton and um, I mean, his, I mean, his genius, I don't need to go through the genius of everything he did. He, he figured out mechanics. He figured out gravitation. He figured out, um, he figured out uh, the, some basic properties of light. He was one of the first people to really seriously employ um, experimentation and induction in practice. Um, in on on levels that had never been seen before so his his genius goes without saying but something i'll say that i think a lot of people don't know about newton i think one of newton's major achievements was his the ethical life he lived i think part of the key to newton's genius was his unsullied commitment to truth like just absolute dedication to the truth and nothing else. Um, he just literally wanted to know the answer for his own selfish personal gain. And when other people didn't, there were times when other people didn't want to hear it. He wasn't persecuted nearly. I mean, he wasn't really persecuted like Galileo was, but at one point he gave a presentation to the Royal, um, to some, to some set of intellectuals in England. And the guy who was in charge of the, um, in charge of the uh, committee, Robert Hooke, didn't like a lot of things Newton was saying about light because it refuted what Hooke was saying. And Newton didn't bother sharing anything about his work with anyone for like 20 years after that because he's just like, what's the point? Why would I tell people when they don't want to listen? And so telling other people about it was just so secondary to Newton. He just wanted the answer and that's it. And I, I think that is 
So I, I, I bitched and moaned for so long about how irrational physicists are. Like, yeah, there's a lot to say. It's a huge injustice. Um, but then I asked, what the hell am I even, why does this matter? Oh, it's because I want to be a physicist. I want to discover things about the physical world. So I'm like, okay, well, stop bitching and do it. Harriman gave you a lot of things you need to do the job. Do it. Stop, stop complaining and do it. Now, now this is actually in as a, as a foil to the other guy I wanted to tell you about, who is, uh, a, is a lesser known physicist, Ludwig Boltzmann, um, who came up with statistical mechanics. And Boltzmann lived in um, Germany in the late 1800s. And as you may, uh, you know, as you'll discover from reading uh, The Ominous Parallels by Peikoff, pre-war Germany was a philosophical uh, cesspool. Um, yeah, like it was the, their philosophical, the, the physicists were explicitly against making physical hypotheses about things we couldn't directly see. For example, atoms. They, they didn't think, we couldn't literally see atoms back then, by the way. We, can't, we couldn't literally see atoms until I think 2001 or something like that. Um, but they couldn't literally see atoms back then. So they didn't believe in them because they, say they, they were of the philosophic conviction that you shouldn't talk about things you can't literally see. Um, yeah, like, um, and, and Boltzmann was against this. Boltzmann had a theory of statistical mechanics, which assumed the existence of atoms and talked about, you know, cause and effect relationships instead of the simple appearances, you know, just coming up with mathematical schemes of describing appearances. And he was rejected. He was laughed at. And he realized the reason for this was he had, and Boltzmann actually realized that the reason was because of philosophy, but Boltzmann just didn't have the genius of Rand when it came to philosophy. So he couldn't untangle the crazy knots that people were in back then. Um, but he did try. I, I lined up some Boltzmann quotes. I, I mean, well, I already had these stashed away, but here's one of them. Here's, here's, this isn't even a quote. This is a title of one of his lectures. This is a lecture he gave in philosophy. Here's the title. Proof that Schopenhauer was a degenerate, unthinking, unknowing, nonsense scribbling philosopher whose understanding consists solely of empty verbal trash. That's the name of the, the speech. <laughs> um, he, uh, was, he was he was a firebrand for reason in his time. Um, but I think he just couldn't hold it together and he ended up killing himself um he was the only one who fought for the ideas he uh he believed in um but i think i think there's a certain um you know he, here's a here's a quote by him he says bring forward what is true write it so that it's clear defend it to your last breath newton wouldn't have done that if they don't want like i, I mean and and i think newton is right on some level the, it should be more like this. Discover what is true. Write it so that you're clear on it. Repeat. If other people don't want to know it, I mean, that's... I may change my mind on this, but I'm not that interested in convincing other people. Mostly just because other physicists seem too confused or second-handed. I'm not going to... Or both... I'm, I'm not concerned. I'm not going to blow my brains out trying to explain it to them. I, I'm just going to figure it out myself. That's the plan or, or die trying. So, so yeah, those are two physicists that sort of, I, I admire both of them, but I've selected one as my inspiration and rejected the other. I think Boltzmann kind of reared into himself. He, he let the sins, he, he made himself pay for the sins of others. Because he he wanted to explain it to them, he did, he he hated the fact that reason was being rejected. Uh, I mean, I hate it too, but it's not my problem. I mean, it is, but I still have to figure this out. <laughs> mm, okay, okay, I've got some listeners' questions now. Let's get those done. Uh, cool. Okay. 
David Harriman said that we don't really understand what light is. Can you elaborate on what is and is not known? Oh, 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 cool. That's a good question. Um, so, um, uh, I think, um, I, I don't want to speak for David Harriman, but I think he would agree with me here. Light is an electromagnetic wave. It's a wave of the electric and the magnetic fields. Okay. What are the electric? I'm going to do a reduction kind of, I mean, this isn't as good as what I'll do in my, what I do in my series, but I'm going to do a quick reduction. So what's, so that light is this wave of the electric and the magnetic fields. Okay. What are the electric and magnetic fields? The electric and magnetic fields are some kind of emanation that charged particles and magnets shoot out in order to push around other charged particles and magnets. So whatever it is, the, 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 the charged particle is like shooting out or what, and it's doing something to its surroundings. And we call that effect a field. Okay. And we know it's doing that effect to its surroundings for two reasons. Number one, it's pushing particles around. Number two, the effect as I said earlier, actually, it spreads out according to an inverse square law. So that indicates that it's spreading out in this spherical fashion, which indicates that the field, it really is having some sort of spherically spreading effect. And then, of course, when we see that light is a wave of this effect or property, whatever it is, um, we, we know that the effect or property, the field is a real thing that ex it's a real effect or property, but what is it an effect? What, like, what is it a property of, what is it an action? It's either an action or a property of some thing, but we don't know what the thing is. And so that's what David Harriman means when we say we don't know what light is. And so we know part of it, and then we don't, but there's this really important aspect of it we don't know. Dwayne, would you put it a different way? I saw you kind of. No, uh, no, no, okay. I agree. Oh, okay, okay. That was a different, I, I, I missed yeah, I that. Was something else. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. Okay, we've got another one. Um, can present physics theories account for the process of photon creation and destruction? Um, I don't have an opinion on that. Hmm. I'm just I, basically uh, this. This is a good time for me to actually say that. Um, let's see. Actually, I'm. Ooh. Um, no, 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 no. Let's not do this. I, I, I was accessing the live stream, but then we'll end up with a horrendous echo if I do that. There's a question someone asked first that um, that I that we should get to just so that because he asked because intellectual ammunition asked a question first and we shouldn't skip him. Um, we, sh we, we shouldn't miss out on him anyway. Um, so. Ah, so I don't have an opinion on that uh, photon creation and destruction. Um, uh, I have not induced, I have not produced a rigorous induction of anything past the year 1860, I want to say. Now, my knowledge goes past 1860. Up until about 1920, I have a flimsy induction. <laughs> By the time I'm done with my summary of inductive summary of physics, I'll have like an okay induction of everything up till probably about 1920. But anything after that, um, I simply don't have an opinion on it because anything that I think particle creation and destruction was, I don't know when, the 60s maybe. It was after 1920 is all I know. The physics of 1900 through 1920 was extremely important and and extremely confused. There is a ton of brilliant insights in that period of history, and they're completely entangled with a bunch of bad philosophical thinking and probably incorrect physics. So, um, and so anything that happened in the 60s because of induction because of how induction works, anything that they did in the 60s would be based on that flawed work. 
and since I and so and since I don't I don't reject that flawed work. I don't I don't just you know flip it the bird and say it's all garbage because it isn't. It makes correct predictions. It's getting something right, but it's in it's entang all of that good stuff is entangled with a ton of bad stuff. And I don't know where the good stuff starts and the bad stuff begins. So anything that comes after 1920, with a couple exceptions like Bell's work um, in the 60s, I think uh, anything that comes after the 1920s. I don't really contemplate. I don't even watch the Discovery Channel because I want to actually know the answer. I don't want, and and also I get sick of Michu Kaku telling me about multiple universes. It makes me want to <laughs> shoot a hole in the TV. <laughs> but you know, even if it weren't for him, um, I, I want to know the real answer. So I don't, I don't really want, I don't really consume physics that I'm not in a position to understand. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Did you want to answer some of intellectual emissions uh, answers from the, like, you know, other I'm live stream? I'm having trouble finding. Uh, Hopefully he's still on and he can copy and paste because I can't find I've got, the, I've got them here. He's, he's okay. asking about inertia. I can, I can. Could I, you I just can text me that, that pile of things he asked? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and, and I'll just go through them one at a time um, because... I think I can private message you in here. Let's send you there. Okay. You can always just use Facebook. I have the tab open. Yeah, yeah. I have like 60 yeah. tabs open. Okay, did you get that one? Um I got to send it on Facebook. It's okay. <laughs> oh, I got it. Yep. Oh, but that's gonna cancel what I have over. It's gonna okay, I'll just my use video. It. No, no, I got it. <laughs> okay. We're juggling we're juggling all of these <laughs> different computer things all at once. Okay, so all right. Um, it's pasting. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I have to wait. I'm just going to read it off. Okay. Uh, Intellectual Ammunition Department asks, what is the concept of it? What does the concept of inertia differentiate? And then he, he has sort of four parts to his question. Is the concept generalizing or specializing? Two, what is the proximate and fundamental genus. Okay, I think I know what that means. Um, three, what are two similar instances? And four, what is a third instance which serves as a differentia? Okay, so I'm gonna go through these. I asked intellectual ammunition department, I asked him what motivated his question though, so I could understand it better. And he said, mm. he said, I tried to understand what the concept of inertia means and I couldn't answer questions like the four I just asked you. So as a result, I'm not sure if it's a valid concept or not. Okay, so that's a good motivation. So he's motivated his question as, and uh, which is part of my process of induction. So if you want more on that, just watch my uh, uh, inductive summary of physics. But basically, I think a question on its own to make it clear, you need to show how your prior context of knowledge led to the question, because otherwise it's not like, why are you asking this? Like, it's not clear what, what you're looking for, but he wants to make sure the concept actually relates to reality. And that's a good motivation. So, um, so what does the concept of inertia identify? That's how I'm going to sort of read his question. Number one, is it generalizing or specializing? So is it, is it like, I think I'm taking him to mean does it group together a bunch of things or does it differentiate something from other things? I would say it does both. Um, so inertia, first I'll just tell you what inertia is. Inertia is an object's resistance to acceleration. So um, if you have a body, if you have, I'll take sort of a simple case where there aren't a bunch of factors going on. Say, um, you have a rocket ship out in space. It's just floating. Um, it fires its engine and that engine produces a certain amount of force. The larger the ship is, the less the acceleration that force will produce. So if you've got a big ship, it won't speed up very fast. If you've got a small ship, it'll speed up at a greater rate. It will gain more speed each second. Okay. And so what people found is 
uh, when scientists tested this, they found that larger objects tended to speed up less with a given force. They had ways of measuring force with springs, actually, is what they used. They had a, that's how they measured the force was with springs. So they knew how much force they were applying to certain objects, and they found that generally bigger objects accelerated uh, less than smaller objects. And so, but they wanted to find the cause of what the cause of this uh, diminishment of acceleration. They wanted to see what is it about big objects that causes them to accelerate less. And so what they did is they tested different volumes of the same material. So let's say they used one um, cubic inch of gold. I don't know if this is exactly what they did, but they, they, it was something like this. They test a cubic inch of gold and they apply a certain force to it. Then they tried two cubic inches of gold and the resulting acceleration was found to be half as much. Then they tried three cubic inches of gold and they found the acceleration was one third as much. And so what they find is, okay, it's mass that causes inertia and inertia here is the resistance to acceleration. So, so instead of directly answering your question, what I kind of did is give a short induction, a short indication of like what observations led to the concept. So a lot of times, it seems like what you're trying to do intellectual ammunition, it seems like what you're trying to do is like, you're trying to reduce the concept. You're assuming the concept like existed to begin with, and then you're trying to relate it back to reality. Another thing that you can do is you can ask what, you can go forward. You can say, okay, at what point in history did they actually need this concept and what observations led them to it? And sometimes that's easier than a reduction. Um, Peacock talks about both in his epistemology lectures. Um, and my focus is actually on induction and going forward. Uh, whereas objectivism in, ge in, in general, the objectivist literature it, and, and then also PCOS literature uh, focus us on reduction. And, and, and I mean, the reason for this is objectivism doesn't have a theory of induction. So it, it uses the tool of taking our concepts and then relating them back to reality rather than going forward, which we can now do thanks to David Harriman, which is what I'm doing. So anyway, but let's answer your questions is the concept generalizing or specializing. So it's doing both. It's saying all bodies have this property which resists acceleration and, and then specializing. It's only material, it's only objects comprised of matter or existence comprised of matter which have this. So it generalizes and specializes it or, or I mean, it's almost, it's like it integrates, it puts things together and it differentiates. It separates them from the things that don't have inertia. Number two, what is the proximate and fundamental genus for inertia? The proximate genus, that means like the narrow category it's part of and then the fundamental genus would be the broad category it's a part of. So like, um, it's the proximate genus. Um, it's a physical property. And then like the fundamental genus would be, it's an attribute. I guess if you wanted to put it in one of Aristotle's categories, it's an attribute of an entity. What kind of entity? A physical uh, a, a body, a, a, an object made of a, a, an existent made of matter. So, so I mean, I don't think you need to go through this to know it's a valid concept though, to, to address your motivation, intellectual ammunition. You don't need to go through all of that in order to know it's a valid concept. I think you just need to sh see it's good to do all of this. You're asking, it's good to do this to, connect this concept with a bunch of other concepts, but you can see that it's a valid concept from the induction. Then later you can make these integrations, which is what you're trying to do here. Um, and so I think I would, I would say like, I would, I would say, unless you have a follow up here, I would say, that's my, that's my answer for now, because I think I've, I think I like in with an induction of the concept, 
you've proven that it's a valid concept. You don't need to answer all of these questions in order to know it's a valid concept. You, you, you can answer these questions in order to connect it with other things you know. That's my understanding of how this works. So, but you can always ask a follow-up. Yeah. That was okay. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we've kind of covered this, I guess. Uh, tell, tell us about some of your favorite sources of inspiration. Um, which authors speak slash speakers do you draw the most from uh, or get the most inspiration from? I mean, we've kind of covered this, but yeah, right. to add? <laughs> yeah I would I would say definitely, you know, sort of this dichotomy I, I draw into my own mind between Boltzmann and Newton. Um, Boltzmann being kind of the way I used to th see things and Newton being what I strive towards now. But this perspective, I think, misses something still. The, the outside world matters somehow, but it, it mattered to me in the wrong ways in the past. So this is still something I'm working out. But those two men served as sort of inspiration um, in, in both ways uh, to, to demonstrate this real struggle you have in, in a culture like the one we have now. Okay. Um... Uh, this, this would be fun. Uh, tell us about some of your experiences in academia. <laughs> yeah, so speaking is, about... Is, is, that, is going into academia something you would um, recommend for those interested in physics? Why or why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, why or why not? Um, yeah, so academia. Um, so let me think. Um, I think, I mean, so in physics, um, in, in, in the field of, there's only a few fields in academia where I'm comfortable in making a statement, but I can make very strong statements in these fields. Um, these three fields are, um, physics, philosophy, and psychology. Um, and I think if you're interested in these three fields, um, act, if you're interested in studying these th three fields as a means of um, being an academic, being, and I mean this in the non-pejorative way, if you want to be an academic, if you want to be a student of the physical world or a student of the mind or a student of philosophy, the last place you want to go is academia. Um, all of the, and this includes if you're an objectivist and you think you can like somehow, um, I don't know, like make it better or something. Um, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe you can make it better. I don't think you can, but you can try. But here's something to think about. Do you want to waste your time with people who already had a chance at understanding Ayn Rand and they threw her in the garbage, which is what most academic philosophers uh, are at least in philosophy and psychology. Like people are aware of Rand. Like Rand is out there. Ari has done a good job. You know, who, her books are are out there. Um, you know, people who didn't even have the virtue to say that all of these floating abstractions are nonsense and have the decency to just get a regular job because all of this was just garbage. Like, do you really want to try and convince those people rather than think about? these ideas for yourself and make new discoveries. Like what's more important to you? Um, and I think among objectivists, when they go into academia, they get m far too concerned with what other academics are, what other academics think. Um, it's, it's, it, to me, being an academic or, or like an intellectual means you're interested in finding the truth. Um, and academia has nothing to do with that. They're, they're so confused. They're, first of all, their premises are completely confused. In physics, they um, you know, are looking for mathematical patterns and no longer ask questions about cause and effect relationships in the physical world. In psychology, they reject, I, they reject free will. Uh, and that's, that's like rejecting the physical world. And in philosophy, they're so lost that they're talk, they now talk about analytic philosophy. What they talk about, they are arguing over what people mean when they use certain words. 
that's how, yeah, that's how down in the gutter these three fields are in academia. So if you want, so, and, and if you go into academia, um, you will be judged and evaluated by people who signed on with this, uh, garbage. Um, you will be evaluated by your work will be evaluated by such people. You will have to one way or another conform to their standards. If you want to make progress, that's been my experience. If you figured out some way around this, let me know. Um, my way around this has simply been to, uh, like, I mean, I'm a college professor, but I, I teach at a community college and, um, I don't, um, I don't, when I, when I explain physics the way I do it, I don't mention to anyone that this is a controversial way of approaching physics. <laughs> um, so, um, and that's, that's based and like, that's been my strat strategy. Um, so, and then, yeah, so like, so in these fields, pe number one, people are completely confused. Number two, um, if you read Ayn Rand's essay called The Establishment of an Establishment, she explain. I'm not going to go into the details, but basically she explains why government runs science. And this includes government run philosophy, um, makes it so that there's an entrenched establishment in the sciences. And, and there has to be, there has to be, basically there's a set of beliefs, which, and if you don't, if you don't roll with those beliefs, you're, uh, you know, you won't get, you won't get your PhD. You won't get, you won't be able to do the research you want to get. You, you won't be, you'll want to do. Um, so like basically because the sciences are funded by the government that eliminates academic freedom, not in the same way it did for Galileo, but in, in a more complex way, Rand breaks down in that essay. So if you're, you know, I would say get a, a college degree um, maybe, um, at least until the college bubble bursts. Um, but do not go to graduate school if you're in those three fields. In other fields, I don't know. I suspect it's just as bad, but I don't have firsthand knowledge. Like, you know, biology, for example. Um, I suspect it's every bit as bad, but probably for different reasons. Uh, but I, I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, do not, if you're interested in doing what I do and learning, uh, learning new philosophic principles, new, learning new physical principles, discovering them, finding them out. If you're interested in doing that, do not go to graduate school or academia. End of story. Yeah, they're not going to let you, they're not going to let you do any interesting research. They're not going, they're not going to care about your um, rational ideas. This is, this is a national experience. I never went into academia, but my wife did. So, mm -hmm. They would not let her research what she wants to research. Things they let her research are mindlessly boring, like uh, computer, using computer models to find <laughs> uh, extra exoplanets, which is that's really computer science, not math physics. But that was, a, that was supposed to be a PhD. That's a, that's the most tolerable things you could find to research. Right. It's still like a. <laughs> It's still a, yeah, but, but that's probably not what got her into physics to begin with. No, um, she didn't want to run computer, mo she didn't want to do computer modeling. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but it's like, this is the most rational thing she could find because identifying exoplanets and how big they are is a rational pursuit. But um, like, it, it, is. it is. Yeah. It's, it's just like, but, but there's so much that is so much broader and so much more exciting to figure out than just mm. like, Oh, I wonder how many Jupiters are floating around that star, you know? Oh, it, it's interesting, but I wouldn't, it's not the kind of thing I would expect a PhD student to really do in physics in computer science, maybe because the algorithm, because a lot of work, maybe writing the algorithm would have been a good computer science project or something, but for a physics PhD, I don't think it's the kind of thing people going into physics are going to want, going to want to do. It's going to help their career match. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't think yeah. it really shows a lot of physics inside because a lot of times you're just using statistics and computer science. Anyway, yeah, well, you, so. you really need both. I mean, Maxwell did something kind of like this, um, not with computers, but Maxwell using mathematics showed that Saturn's rings had to be made of uh, rocks. He well, showed that they not, couldn't be fluid not, and they couldn't be gas. He showed they had I'm to be not, like rocks. Uh, 
I'm not saying that doing all the mathematics is not going to wouldn't be helpful, but the mm. point is there's not a lot of physics in the so-called physics PhD she was doing. I spent a lot of time doing mathematics and she wasn't really discovering anything or doing anything very interesting qua physics. Yeah. Uh, well, unless you're really into exoplanets. I mean, as you said, that's nice, but for a physics PhD, I don't think that's really suitable, suitable yeah. research. Yeah. I, I think another thing is, is I think, I think at least the reason this, you know, feels really disappointing to me also, um, that, that she had to do that, um, is because, is because there's so many unanswered fundamental questions. And if you want to, if you want to get a PhD, you're, you're, you have to systematically avoid them. Like the electric, you know, light is a wave. What is it a wave of? No, yeah. we already decided that that's an invalid question. Like and you kind of like, have, and you kind of have to research what the department's interested in, in a lot of the time. It's like, not like whatever I want to do. Like, no, no, we've got people, we've got, like her supervisor was into, was, uh, is into exoplanets and stuff. He was one of those, but this, he was an astronomer. So her options are basically limited. There. And I'll, I'm not going to supervise anything else. It has to be one of these things. A lot of the time they just don't let you do anything they're not comfortable with. They don't know it about uh already know a lot about part of that um bureaucracy and stuff and yeah well, what's the word you use um establishment stuff yeah 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 and and i mean um and the the other thing is is that um by and large these people um, in academia are not intellectually virtuous in the way Newton was. They're not independent thinkers. When, when I, um, was getting my, and, 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 and this is systematic, like the, the field drives out independent thinkers. If you're, if you, if you're not, if you're questioning the basic assumptions of prior, of all the prior knowledge, because you're actually trying to get clear on those ideas, you will find yourself, um, You'll, I mean, you'll find yourself without anyone who's interested in following your project because the people in the establishment treat the physics of treat all. I mean, they treat all the existing physics as though it's just a foregone conclusion. They're not interested in the proof. They're, they don't. They don't think it's important that they understand it for themselves. So as a result, when I was getting my master's thesis, and and here's where it comes to Bell's work. I looked at I looked at the work of John Bell in the 60s and concluded that this is a faster than light causal interaction. And no one's saying it. What? No one says it. And it clearly what, what, is. What else, what else could you conclude rationally? I mean. What else could you conclude? You do seems... something over here <laughs> and the statistics of the thing over here change faster than light could carry the signal. No, it's magic. magic yeah, right. Explanation. <laughs> yeah, right. So, but, 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 bec but these, these questions are just off limits. And even the people. Even the people who say that they're questioning the fundamentals of quantum mechanics, even objectivists in the field will not say that there's a faster than light causal interaction. The only people who will say it are me and David Harriman. Even other objectivists will not say it. Um, and it's an absolute travesty. It's, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a scandal um, that, that it's, it's, it's such an obvious causal connection and people won't say it. And part of the reason is, is because it contradicts something Einstein says. But if you actually ask, well, what's your reason for thinking Einstein was right about that? Well, a lot of objectivists will not seriously question the premise of, premises of modern physics because that's the stuff they were taught in college. And I don't really, I think that they just accept a lot of it without a lot of critical thought that don't really induce it or reduce it or anything. They just go, yes, yeah. accept it without yeah. much critical thought. Yeah, so it's 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 a it's a scandal because it's a lack of intellectual virtue. Um, it's it's they they're not. I mean, this is it's if if you just think, oh well, it's not my biz. If you say it's not my business to check Einstein's work, then physics isn't your business. Then you're not a physicist. Stop pretending to be one, and and don't and don't and and so 
when I did. So anyway, I was doing this master's thesis and exactly what you just said happened. I'm, I'm, de I'm defending the thesis. And they said, and they said, well, but that they, and, and I said, yeah, faster than like causal interaction. They're like, we're not passing this. And I said, why not? And they're like, well, that contradicts what Einstein said. I'm like, okay, well, like, okay, well, how do you know that that part of Einstein's theory is right? What's your evidence when there's clear evidence of a causal interaction here? Um, and they said, so, and their only response was, there was two responses. It's like, so you think you're smarter than Einstein? And I said, that's not an argument. Said, we don't have to pass you. We don't have to give you the master's degree. And I said, I don't know what to say to a threat. Um, and so what they did, yeah, like, and, and what's funny is, is I was in just, while I was defending, I had no, um, like, co concept of the stakes. <laughs> I, I didn't, when they said they weren't going to give me the, the master's degree, it, like, didn't hit me because I was just focused on, oh, these people are wrong and I just need to explain it to them. Um, but they don't care um, because they like they've shown that they don't care because they're not willing to question. They don't think it's their business to question the earlier knowledge. So um, and there might be exceptions, but um, and there probably are exceptions of, of varying levels. But the fact that no one says that there no one has the guts to just say there's a faster than light causal interaction. I mean, of people who understand the issues involved, there's plenty of people who don't. But for those who, who've looked into it, it's clear as day and they won't say it because it contradicts things that we're supposed to believe and you won't be taken seriously. And that's the moral failing of, and this, and, and I don't know what else could demonstrate the moral failing of today's academia. Um, that it's, it's, it's not, it's not, it doesn't, they don't, they, they, and it doesn't represent a concern with the truth. Um, and um, and, 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 uh, you know, because you're being judged by such people, because your PhD, you know, your, your progress in the field rests on being able to appease them. The people who get through it, um, uh, make compromises and, uh, it, and, and I think this is why, um, I think this is why, um, you don't see people saying, saying the truth here. Um, I think this is why, yeah. because, because to even get to the top, you have to make compromise to get the master's degree. I had to make a compromise. They told me, okay, basically once, once I said, I, I don't know what to do if you're just going to threaten me. Um, their response to that was, okay, like we'll give you the master's degree, but you have to include more physics in this paper. This is mainly philosophy. You have to include a bunch of crap about, Zeilinger and like other um, people who are doing work in the field right now. And so I appended a bunch of garbage that I didn't really understand to the end of my paper. And I walked away with my slip of paper. I walked, I walked away with my master's degree, but I compromised. Uh, I mean, like not in the deeper sense, because I didn't stop thinking about, um, I didn't stop thinking the way I was thinking, but I put work into the world that was more garbage. Uh, it was more stupid, non-essential garbage. If someone, I've, I've had people come to me, I've had physicists come to me saying like, oh, I really liked your master's thesis. Oh, I'm like, great, okay. And then I start talking to them and they liked the end. They liked the garbage part. Um, so uh, like, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're a Zylinger. Ah! <laughs> I, <laughs> you got me all worked up, Dwayne. So anyway, yeah, don't go into academia. Yeah. I think a lot of objectivists, this, yeah, as you said, they just, uh, get used to compromising and they aren't used to think criti thinking critically about the stuff. Just used to the yeah, game. It, it, no, it, we've got to accept it. Got to accept it. It's, it's physics. It's science. It's unscientific to question this stuff, which is what some objectivists have said to me. It's unscientific to question general the standard interpretations of general general relativity. I think wow. You've had objectivists literally say that. A couple of them. It's I've seen some many, a couple. Quiet, but not straight out say it because it's so not, obvious. Not in, the, not in those exact words. But I'm paraphrasing a bit. But that's okay, okay, what they yeah. said. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, most of them, at least, will 
not say that though at least just parrot stuff mm -hmm. and once you present them the arguments most people will go oh uh, okay fine they'll, yeah they'll eventually see <laughs> well then again there's not much evidence for what, uh, what this thing i just said so yeah i mean look it, it's easy to do it's easy to fall into this because it's the only way to, you know in order to pass the classes you're being taught it in, a certain, in order to pass the class classes as an undergraduate you're being i don't even know if you should go into like an un, be an undergraduate um <laughs> Um, you know, get, get a degree in, I don't know, maybe a phys, I mean, a physics degree is better than a lot of the other garbage degrees, but I, I don't have an opinion on that actually. So, but when you're getting your undergrad in order to, in order to pass the classes, you have to memorize stuff. It's such an insane rate. You don't have time to check it against reality and they're not giving you the means to check it against reality. They're not giving you the evidence that led to the equations. They just give you the equations and then you practice using them on the premise that they're right. So, you know, to, to have the perspective I do takes years upon years of resisting that mindset. And then even more years in pro deprogramming all of that mindset that got in anyway, even though you were resisting it, but uh, like it's hard, but that's the price you have to pay to be a real physicist. And that price has not been paid by the people currently in academia. Um, so they, like, it's not, it's not okay to go in. It's not, if you want to learn physics, that's not where you're going. If, if you want to be a student of the physical world, that's not the place to go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. That was a long answer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The long, the long, it's a, a lot of, lot of, there's, there's a lot to that. Well, if it deters anyone that doesn't need to go into academia, if I'm going into academia, well, maybe it's worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Just think twice, kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't do drugs, don't stay in school. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, I guess it's kind of related. <laughs> I think we kind of covered this too. Uh, what do you think is wrong with modern physics? <laughs> and what are some of the root causes? We've kind of gone into this, but. So, well, we've gone into like um, sort of the academics and their um, uh, moral failings basically, and the political failings of the academic system. But specifically what's wrong with modern physics is, hmm. I mean, the last three lectures of my inductive summary of physics answer this question, so I don't know how to do it quickly. Um, I'll just cover it. I'll just cover two, two things. In quantum mechanics, they conclude that a particle can be in multiple states at once. It can be A and not A. And, it's, and, and the, the claim is, I mean... You just have to listen to Dwayne's stuff, actually, and you'll you'll know all about this. I don't even need to go over this. Like, just do it. you know, see anything, Dave. I'm not even going to answer this. Just watch Dwayne <laughs> go and listen to the lectures of David Harriman on the Ayn Rand e store, especially the philosophical corruption of physics, and then also what's it called? Um, oh, oh man, he. Uh, it's not just philosophical corruption of physics. It's also David Harriman. Do you happen to know the lecture where he explains what's wrong with quantum mechanics? Uh, I'll, I I'll look it up as, yeah, the, <laughs> so yeah. If you're interested in Dwayne's show, you guys, you'll love David Harriman's lectures. They're just fantastic. They'll bring you to the next level on this stuff. Just, I can't, I can't answer this question. Dwayne asked me any better than <laughs> Harriman and, and Dwayne himself have answered it. Like it's, it's really it's that's where you go. I I don't even think about that anymore because I spent years listening to David Harriman, thinking about what he was saying, understanding whether it was true or not, and now I'm just building off of that. So I don't really study that stuff anymore. I don't really think of clear ways to say it. So just listen to David Harriman on that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Oh, the short answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, this is really worded. Would you care to tell us about any of your ideas about? what really might be going on with some of the, uh, some areas of modern physics, such as quantum mechanics, uh, relativity, that kind of thing. I mean, yeah, what's presented as one thing, but what do you think is really happening there? Do you have any comments on that? 
I have a hypothesis. Um, I'm loath to put it out now in, in just an interview, but I'll give you all a hint or I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a hint. That seems like the wrong word. Um, here's the thinking that led me to the hypothesis. So, um, with Maxwell's equations, with the equations of the electric field and the magnetic field and how electric fields can sometimes cause magnetic fields and how magnetic fields can sometimes cause electric fields, these interactions, there was a lot of evidence for what Maxwell and others called an ether. Um, because like I said, a charged particle, it has an effect, a spherically spreading effect on its surroundings. And so what are these surroundings? The surroundings must be a thing. There must be stuff everywhere that carries this field, whatever the field is. And this field must be a property or an action of this underlying stuff. And if you think about it, gravity is the same way. Gravity has an effect on its surroundings. Grav and we just found out recently, you know, a couple years ago, that when a um, black hole or really when any massive object accelerates, it produces waves, gravitational waves. So this gravitational stuff is, you know, maybe there's this stuff, this ether everywhere, which carries the electric field, the magnetic field, gravity. Um, and because it carries the electric and magnetic field, that means that when light waves, it's the ether that's waving somehow. There's some property of the ether or the ether is somehow committing an action that is a wave type action. And so, um, you know, so um, what is this ether? People were asking this question after Maxwell was starting to put this stuff together. I think people were asking this question for a long time. I mean, depending on how you look at it, Parmenides was sort of the first person to think of this, um, the philosopher Parmenides. But anyway, so there's this evidence of this stuff everywhere. But then there was a particular experiment where they tried to measure it and they failed to measure it, the Michelson-Morley experiment. Okay, and I think I'll, like a full description of that will wait for my video 17 in my inductive summary of physics. But um, they couldn't measure... Um, our velocity through the ether. They thought, basically they thought, hey, if light is a wave of the ether, then we should be able to use properties of that wave to measure how fast the earth is moving through the ether. And they couldn't do it. And they couldn't do it. Um, and, and then this guy, Heinrich Lorentz, came up with, a, came up with an explanation. He said, um, he said, maybe when we move through the ether, it causes objects to contract in a way that makes the motion undetectable. It causes our rulers to shrink. And this causes us to basically not notice when we're moving through the ether. It causes the measurement of our motion through the ether to go away because motion through the ether makes things shrink. Well, people rejected that theory and instead went with Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, if, you'll, if, you, if you remember from physics class, the equations of special relativity are called the Lorentz transformations, not the Einstein transformations, because Lorentz and Fitzgerald, this Irishman, came up with them. Um, and, uh, and Einstein, all Einstein's contribution was, was to say, what if we just get rid of the ether and just talk about the measurements. We stop talking about physical cause and effect relationships, which actually cause th the velocity to look like zero. Um, and we just talk about the measurements and that's it. And so that was done on philosophical grounds because at the time, um, physicists believed that we should only talk about measurements and we shouldn't talk about physical cause and effect relationships. Um, and modern physicists accept Einstein's views on that, or like accept Einstein's theory without understanding any of the philosophy. They don't think about philosophy at all. So they're sort of like implicitly accepting this bad philosophy, but they haven't thought about it at all. They do think about it when they're, when they're trying to dismiss, actively dismiss it as useless. I disagree. You think they actually take on sort of like a positivist philosophy in order to dismiss Cause and but like the search for cause and effect. No, no, I, I just mean that the only time they do they actually think about it for long enough to dismiss it. 
they, and they end they, up, yeah. They and, end then up they forget about, and then they forget about it again. Right. They they dig up the philosophy, which is implicit in Einstein, shoot it at you, and then forget it. And then if you bring it up again, they'll repeat, and they haven't made any progress on the issue on their own, and they haven't considered your arguments. It's just sort of over and over again, they're just explicating the premises they hold without checking. And then they don't go any further than that. They don't check the premises. They just explicate them and they say, ah, that's good enough. Cause I already know Einstein's right. I mean, look at the guy's hair. How could you be wrong <laughs> when you have crazy hair like that? Clearly he was smarter than me. I can't, I can't, you know, look at him. He didn't make any mistakes. I don't know. So, uh, no. <laughs> so quote, quote what boys, Pseudo pseudo philosophical ramblings. I don't, know, I, 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 don't, I don't even know if you could call that philosophy per se, but yeah, for the attempts to for the attempts to rationalize his um, assumptions, prior assumptions. Yeah, that's a good point. Bohr really which was he didn't say which he didn't say he doesn't have, but sorry, people say he didn't have, but he did have. If anyone who looks at the history knows he has these his mentors are all neo-Kantians so I don't know how we could not have these premises beforehand which he then claimed to came up came up had um he claimed to have these views after he proved them but one no. yeah yeah Harriman definitely documents thoroughly um yeah like the the what? the philosophical leanings of people like Bohr and that, Heisenberg that quote, before they came Harriman, up with the theory what's that quote Harriman gave I don't know if Bohr actually said this uh, it was a friend of Bohr. Bohr was saying, oh, the particles yeah. in two places at once. It's all subjective. This is what we've concluded because of the evidence. And then some onlooker said, yeah, but Niels, you were talking about this 20 years ago. Years ago. <laughs> that's the one, yeah. you, you, told us this, you told us this 20 years ago. I know. You told yeah. us this 20 years ago. <laughs> that's the <laughs> yeah, one. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, which, 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 which one was that? In? Oh, I should. In, in Harriman's lectures. Which one was that? Which lecture was that? And that's. Was that, was that the quantum physics one you were talking about before? It probably was. I believe it was. Uh, well, it, it, he probably used it um, a number of times since it's such a showing quote. He definitely used yeah. it in the uh, philosophical corruption in, of physics. But um, yeah, uh, but maybe in his quantum <laughs> lecture as well. Um, let's uh, let's uh, see. Maybe you can just give it a, 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 as a link in the description. Yeah, um, I'll wait. Okay. Lectures. I'll so dig it up. I, I have that lecture somewhere. Yeah, it might it might even be in the yeah the notes for that lecture. I put it at quote. Okay. Uh, okay, we finished that question. Okay, what's that one? Uh, don't know it. Don't know it. Uh, okay, which books sources would you recommend to learn more about physics? Mm, um, definitely logical. Or philosophy, yeah. Or philosophy, philosophy, if you want. Or philosophy. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, so, like either or. So, um, for uh, for physics, um, so of course, um, so to learn physics, just kind of the basics, um, like front to back. There's no course better than Dave, David Harriman's. Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Fundamentals of Physical Science, which you can find on the Van Dam Academy's website. So maybe if you just Google Van Dam Academy Fundamentals of Physical Science, um, that lecture is four hundred dollars though. But oh well, it's not one lecture. It's like it's hours upon hours. It's two school years worth of lectures. For last I checked, it was four hundred bucks. Best four hundred bucks I ever spent. Um, another place you can get like a full like summary of physics is my lecture series. I'm going to go just from the beginning to the end of what I consider knowable um, or at least, well, what's knowable to me. Maybe I'm missing things, but <clears throat> um, then another surprising source of really good physics. If you want to read a book, where to go? <clears throat> here it is. Is this book right here? Um, the History of Physics by Isaac Asimov. And yes, the same Isaac Asimov, the robot guy. Um, Asimov is a really good nonfiction writer. And this is a very good 
semi-inductive explanation of physics. He goes kind of in an inductive order. He asks a lot of good questions. A lot of, you can tell as he went through these concepts, he asked, well, how do we actually know that? And he answers it a lot of the times. He gives really good explanations. Um, so in general, Asimov is a, is a good thinker. Oh, I mean, he's not an objectivist, but he, um, you'll learn stuff from him. So and this is a good read that one. Yeah. Um, so, um, and then also, let's see, he, this is his book. It's black. It's just get this black book guys. Okay. It's, uh, Asimov on numbers. Um, this is his treatment of math and he thinks about it semi-inductively, especially in the beginning. Um, that being said, there's, I mean, between me and Harriman, there's actually a lot of actual inductive treatments of physics. So you may want to just start there. It'll be better than these. Um, I will also be giving an inductive demonstrate, like proof of mathematics. Um, so um, that's, um, that's out there um, as well. Um, so that's, that's, uh, but this is a good book. This, this Asimov book is really good. It's good for a lay audience. Hell, it's even, I mean, it's better than any freaking physics book, even if you're a physics professional, because it really, it won't teach you how to make complex calculations, but the only reason complex calculations would ever matter is if you thoroughly understood the cause and effect relationships to begin with. And modern physics textbooks will not give you that. So Asimov is the best book I'm aware of that gives you a full treatment of physics. Yeah, even though it's written for lay audiences, the mathematics isn't very involved. It'll at least tell you the cause and effect of what's going on. Yeah. A lot of times it's not perfect. Hmm. Yeah. I have to read that one. I have to read that one. Okay. Um, kind of covered this too. Actually, we kind of covered everything else on this list, but okay. Uh, in which ways is philosophy important to physics? Kind of circling um, back a bit here. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I, I would just I would just emphasize the two ways, the two different ways it's important is epistemology and metaphysics. Um, I even mentioned ethics too. Like the 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 science, the true scientist is motivated to know. And he doesn't put other motivations ahead. Just and and you know the the, the real scientist has integrity. Um, Howard Rourke is concerned with building a building. Qua his career, he doesn't put other things in front of his vision of what a good building means. Um, the physicist doesn't put other considerations ahead of the truth, whether it's you know. So that's that's how ethics applies. But epistemology. We need particular epistemic methods in order to learn science. It's not enough to just be virtuous and be committed to the truth. You have to, that once you do that, you have to figure out, well, what by, by what method do I obtain the truth? Um, and then there's metaphysics, which, and what we will find is, is that metaphysics assists us in identifying aspects of physics. So for example, um, in, uh, you know, uh, in chemistry, Lavoisier, the chemist, um, and this is kind of physics, kind of chemistry. Lavoisier says, metaphysically, something can't come from nothing. So we can't have spontaneous generation of new chemicals. Something, similarly, something that is cannot go out of existence. It, it can change its form, but it can't just simply cease to exist. And so we can't have chemicals just disappearing. We need to like account for our mass, uh, like all the mass that goes into our reaction and comes out of our reaction. So by thinking in terms of certain metaphysical principles, science has made advancements on the basis of metaphysical, like using metaphysics and metaphysics has been entirely thrown in the garbage by modern physicists, which is why they don't make progress in understanding the physical world. Um, so metaphysics has a huge role to play as well. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's, so yeah, those are, the, those are the two ways or the three ways it's important. 
okay, intellectual ammunition's got another question for us. Mm. Are you aware of the physicist Harold Harold Espden, A S P D E N? If so, what is your evaluation of his work? Uh, no, I'm not aware. Sorry. Neither am I. Mm. Okay. Um, okay. Ooh. Why do you think so many of physics dismiss philosophy? Mm. Um, I think in I think in general it's the same reason everyone dismisses philosophy. It's because when you see philosophers talking about stuff, um, they're talking about a bunch of crap that appears to not have any relation to reality. Like, I mean, modern philosophers, they literally, analytic philosophers are literally concerned as their primary, with this is what they think philosophy is. They think philosophy is about identifying the, the way people tend to use words. That's what they do. If you ever think about your philosophy, modern philosophy classes you're in, like ask yourself, is this what they're doing? You will find that's what that is all they're concerned with. Literally, what do the words mean? Or not even what they mean, not even like what they should refer to in reality. Just literally, what do people, what are people trying to mean when they say this word? That's like, they're trying to capture our, our intuitive definitions of words. That's what they're doing. So... As a result, who can blame anyone who they see this and they're like, oh, I reject that garbage. Um, uh, you know, that has nothing to do with reality. This is physics. Um, but unfortunately, if you don't think on the level of philosophy, uh, you just end up accepting the philosophy, which is uh, implicit in the ideas that, you know, the physics ideas, which you absorbed without checking. And so, they're kind of like modern physicists are sort of just default Kantians because they're working with ideas that don't like that, that are just sort of mathematical schemes for keeping track of observations without identifying physical cause and effect relationships. So as a result, they're not even aware of the question. Like, for example, when I, when I said that, dude, there's a faster than light causal interaction, they didn't know what the hell I meant by causal interaction. They didn't know what that meant. They were like, well, what about the transfer of, inf there's no information transfer. Well, I don't know what that means. I don't know what it, well, I mean, I think it means something, but it's it's not relevant to what I'm saying. Um, yeah, so like, so, the, um, so why is it, wait, what was the question? <laughs> I'm, every time I think about modern physicists, Dwayne, I just, I, I get on this rant. You 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 got me all riled with these questions. What was the question? Uh, why they dismiss philosophy? Yeah, I, I I would I would just say that for now. It's 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 just because it's it's because um, you know, uh, it's because it seem it's because so many other philosophers, um, you know, it just it just seems like their work doesn't matter. But I think it's also because. They're not thinking independently on the issues. I think you start, th I think there's certain physicists who they're completely freaking confused, but they're more independent than other physicists and they show it. Like for example, Lee Smolin, you ever heard of Lee Smolin? I think he's one of the more independent ones. There's one lecture where I could see that he was actually questioning some things and he realized, oh, we need to think about philosophy here. He mentions that in this book about, um what's wrong his book, book criticizing string theory which is not very good philosophically but he does he does mention such issues and i think he does mention philosophy in the book sort yeah of, kind of offhand but i don't think he, it doesn't really go to much depth but yeah it's clear he has he has is an independent thinker and he and talks about I mean, this is just for challenging string theory. That alone makes him more independent than ninety percent of his peers, which is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I yes. think his independence goes even further than that because you know he's at one lecture he's yes, up yes. there doing this and he's explaining um, and he's explaining. I mean, he's the person who's gotten closest to saying that there's a faster than light causal interaction. In fact. I think I would be willing to bet if I if I got up there and asked him a question during one of his lectures and I said, faster than light causal interaction, yes or no? He would say, I think he would publicly say yes. Have you read his latest book? 
which is apparently quite good. I haven't read it yet. No, I, I, I no, I, I, I don't, I don't. Would you read it? Maybe, maybe, him, maybe I'm not going to read a book by that. I, I'll, I read it. I'll read it. Maybe speak later about it there. I don't know. Mm. I'm in no rush to read it, but <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Um, but but in in a lecture I listened to him. Uh, he he got really close to saying it. He, he I think he he went so far as to imply it. Ooh. Um, so I I think it it strikes me that he um, would have the courage and the uh, the 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 knowledge to to uh, assent to that. Yeah. Um, but I still think it's showing that he won't just come out and say it. Like that's yeah. that, I think I think this is the case. He's a case of someone who. He would have been intellectually independent, but he's just been in academia so long and he's just has all these habits like, you know, you have to dance around your point. You can never just straight up say your point or else the committee will find it really easy to find something wrong with it. You won't get published. You, you know, he's still on that kind of premise. Yeah, that's the impression I got from the other book I read. He's, it's a big, long book on what's wrong string theory. He, it's like this thick, probably now you need to be like that thick, spends a lot of time going into, into string theory and stuff, I guess because he had to go into a lot of that to get published, I don't know, the publisher said, oh, I, need, I need to talk about string theory in depth, oh, I don't know, it's a lot, it's been like half the book talking, going into too much depth on string theory, but I mean, it's a book only needed to be like that long, it's like this thick. And, yeah, I mean, you I know. Wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily suggest reading it, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the arguments against string theory, um, are philosophical in nature. And if you're not, if, if, if you, if you don't think of that as an absolute, you're going to end up saying a hell of a lot of words. You just don't need to say. He, he gets kind of close to identify as a philosophical issue, but uh, I don't think he, I haven't read the book for a while. He doesn't he quite may, get there. Though, yeah. but, he's, but he is thinking about it at least. He is uh, trying uh, on his own in at least a semi independent manner. Yeah. I think there's a lot of quest there's a lot of premises he hasn't questioned, but there are a lot he has. Yeah. Hmm. Lee uh, He does this with his finger his fingers. It's real weird, but that's what he does. Hmm. <laughs> uh, what was the question? Uh, what was the question? Oh uh, yeah, right. Why do they dismiss where were we before we got Oh, you asked why do they dismiss philosophy? Why do modern physicists yeah. dismiss philosophy? Yes. Got off on a little tangent there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so are we done? Okay. Next one. Um, um, there, was, there was one more question I think that um, is pretty cool. Um, uh, you you one of your questions you wrote down is tell us some of the most ingenious experiments performed in that's, physics. That's, yeah, that's yeah, what I was going to ask next. I just had one that like really there's a there's a lot of good ones. There's a lot of ingenious experiments. Just watch the inductive summary of physics. You'll see all sorts of just really cool experiments. Although. If you if you watch if you watch Le Harriman's lectures or my lectures, you'll be struck by something that will strike you is, is not only how ingenious some of the observations and experiments are, but also they get demystified. Genius will no longer mean to you magic. Newton, you know, Eratosthenes figured out the size of the Earth with a stick. How magic? No. It makes you can understand how he did it. It makes perfect sense, you know. And as long as you go in order, and you can, it's like, oh, they figured out what radiation is. How did they do it? Well, they had to know all sorts of other stuff beforehand. But if you know that other stuff, you'll still think it's really ingenious. But you'll realize, oh, it makes perfect sense why they thought of that. That's it's like I, I could have thought of that. I mean. Yeah, you could have if you fully understood the whole context of knowledge and thought real hard about it. Yeah, you could, probably you could have. Um, that's that's what these geniuses were, as uh, you know, Edison said. They put a lot of work into it, but they didn't just put a lot of work into it. They knew, they understood all the existing ideas for themselves, and that's what allowed them to apply those ideas properly and then come up with new knowledge. 
But uh, one experiment I wanted to tell you about is um, uh, Heinrich Hertz uh, was the f was testing Maxwell's theory of electromagnetic waves. Um, Maxwell Maxwell was the first to hypothesize that light is actually a waving of the electric and the magnetic fields. And so what Hertz does is he creates for the first time radio waves. And radio waves, it turns out, are a color of light that our eyes cannot see. Um, it's just a different color of light, but it's a color that our eyes can't see. Like snakes, for example, can see in infrared and actually so can a digital camera. A digital camera can see and you won't see that come out of my remote control if I point it at your eyeball, but cameras can see with colors that we can't. Um, and so Hertz generates these radio waves and he wants to see if it's really light. So one of the things he does is he knows that light will bend when it goes through a prism. Okay. Because, you know, but what Hertz found is his radio waves would actually go through concrete. So he's thinking, hmm, if I could see in these waves I'm making, I could see through concrete. It would be transparent to concrete. So what Hertz does is he makes a prism out of asphalt. He pours a big triangular slab of asphalt, shoots his radio waves through it, and the radio waves bend in the same way visible light bends when it goes through glass. I thought that was so cool because it, it requires such a level of abstraction. A slab of concrete is the same as a slab of glass. It's the same. It's it's essentially the same. Light bends when it goes through it. Let's see if the radio, you know, my special, he didn't call them radio, but my special waves, let's see if they go through and they bend and they totally did. So I thought that was a really cool experiment because of the, the, the kind of mind that looks at a slab of glass and a slab of asphalt and says, that's basically the same thing. That's, that is what it means to be a physicist. Okay. Oh, do you want to tackle this one? Um, do you want to comment on Lewis Little's theory of elemental waves? I got a oh, few yeah. listeners who um, keep asking about this. I haven't talked about it yet, but do you have any you, thoughts I, on it? Have you addressed that at all on your show? No, I haven't got around to it yet. Okay. Have you have you uh, contacted the man? I haven't contacted contacted him myself. No. Okay. I um, read something read something about it a while ago. I haven't really looked into it in great depth. Not for a while. So. Yeah. So. Um, um, I'll preface this by saying that I haven't induced my way all the way to quantum mechanics. So I'm not 100% sure of my re reasonings here, but um, I looked at a lot of his papers and there was one particular experiment. I believe it was the double delayed choice experiment that his work apparently cannot account for and his work apparent and his work um, contradicts the outcome of that experiment. Um, and he wrote a paper which explained why his work does not contradict the outcome of that experiment, but the paper was extremely unclear. And even when I read it really carefully, it didn't seem to actually make the point it was trying to make. Um, and I suspect it may have been a work of sophistry because the paper was taken down. I actually had to use the Wayback Machine to access this paper Lewis Little made. Um, so um, it seems like, um, yeah, it seems like that um, isn't going to work out, but it may have certain ideas. What, From what I understand, Lewis Little thinks he could explain certain aspects of relativity using quantum mechanics. He can actually deduce parts of relativity from his quantum, it, from his account of quantum mechanics which I also have reason to believe is a possibility. Um, but, and basically what I'll say is, is I think, so I think Lewis Little's work may have some fruitful details to take from. I, it, it, there's maybe, um, especially some, there might be some fruitful details to take there, but it, it appears the theory's wrong. Um, um, and, and ba and I'll and I said I would I said I would kind of tell you what my hypothesis is and I guess I'll I'll leave you with um I'll leave you with one more teaser which is that I think there is an ether I think and and I suspect that this ether 
carries not only electric, magnetic, gravitational, but I, I suspect it also carries matter itself. Because in quantum mechanics, we find that matter in motion has a wave type property. Matter, when it moves, cancels itself the same way light cancels itself as a wave. So it seems like, you know, so this kind of answers the question you asked earlier. So this leads me to suspect that matter, light, gravity, and then maybe the strong and weak forces, depending on what the details are on those, which I'm not clear on those forces, but maybe those as well, are uh, aspects of this ether, are waves of the ether. And I think when you think of it this way, and this is where I'm going to be vague on purpose because I'll tell you the hypothesis, because the hypothesis is going to be later, and it's only a hypothesis. Um, I don't even know if this counts as a hypothesis. It's more of like a research direction. But I think there's, I think there's something almost, I think there's something really deep we're overlooking. There's assumptions about what an ether, what the ether means. There's certain assumptions we're making about what an ether would have to be that we haven't checked. And I think if you check those assumptions, you realize a different hypothesis of an ether that hasn't been put forward yet. There's a different way of looking at the ether, different than the way Lorentz looked at it. And it's a way that I think it's a it's a way that I think is implicit in Einstein's work. And as a result, Einstein got a ton of things right in you know physically speaking. And so I think I think there is a there's something that the Lorentzian view of the ether misses. And if we check that premise and move past it, we might be able to integrate. I I, I am hoping that this sort of approach can help us integrate relativity and quantum mechanics and electrodynamics. So that's, uh, that's sort of, that sort of the answers the question from earlier of what, what I think is actually going on. I think it is an ether, but we're missing something really important about what the ether actually, or what the ether could be. So, yeah, we're making a certain unchecked assumption about what the ether would have to be. I'm being a total tease, but I don't want to, I don't want to say it yet. <laughs> okay. And I say one more question to ask. I think we probably kind of covered this, but um, would you care to talk about the difference between the historical approach and your inductive approach? So back you, full circle. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I covered this. Um, yeah. I think what to, to systematize physics, we should ask, by what steps could we have proven this stuff? And that will allow us to get clear on the ideas and systematize it. And we use history as a suggestion for how to prove these ideas in a very streamlined way so that we get very clear on them. And then we use that understanding towards discovering ourselves some new physics. So that's, that's the hope of, of my project. Okay. Um, I think... Yep, that's all the questions. Uh, do you have anything else you would like to add? Um, nothing other than uh, I really like the show, Dwayne, and I'm glad I could be on it, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, you're welcome. I, was, I had a lot of fun. I actually covered a lot of content that the questions didn't cover, actually, so it's always good to go beyond the uh, scope of the questions. Mm -hmm. and we did some good depth on some of these questions. That was good. Um, Okay, any doesn't look like the read, uh, viewers have any questions. Nope. Uh, I guess we I guess I wrap it up there then. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for yeah. thanks for putting up with the delay and and. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry about the delay. Oh God. That was... <laughs> next time, I, next time I just use this thing. I the Streamlabs thing. I think it's just a lot easier. Yeah. But yeah. Um, okay. Should I stop my recording? Yep. Yeah. We'll okay. Cool. Stop here. Yeah, thanks, Dwayne. Yeah, cool. thanks for. I, I uh, I'm glad uh, glad uh, I got the chance to talk to your audience. Okay. Yeah, thank you.